It's good to be back in Florida. A lot of friends here, and there's absolutely no pressure. We heard you last year. What are you going to do this year to make it better? But you know, you warmed me up with that great video. That's just such an amazing video, and it's so nice to see people who are willing to fight for the thing that makes our country work. You know, we have this conversation about a false choice in Texas also. And I like to remind people there's something really simple. Government cannot exist without taxes, and there's nothing to tax without businesses. And that's a message that a lot of people don't understand. Governments cannot exist without taxes, and if we don't create businesses that are profitable, guess what? There's no profit to tax. And if we don't create businesses, guess what? There are no jobs to tax. And so if there's a chicken and an egg, guess what? We are both. And our challenge is we have not done a good job of spreading that message. I was doing a little research for our talk, and I realized that there are only 13 states in the nation that require children to learn about economics. But every state requires kids to learn about the history of their state. Now, what's more important, learning about the history of your state or learning about how our economy works and how everything is put together? We as business leaders have to do a better job of talking to people and working with people so that they understand how businesses work. And I'm going to get to my talk in a minute, but I just had to say that because this video you have just really inspired me. My parents passed away recently, and they went to their graves, very good, wonderful, loving people, believing that if a business was successful, if a businessman or woman was successful, it's because they ripped off the people. Believing that. Good, decent people. They were wrong. And we had conversations about the fact that they were wrong. But that's what they believed. And one of the reasons they believed it is because nobody talked to them about what we do. We go on the assumption that people understand our way of life. They understand what it takes to create a business, to create jobs, to make a payroll. They, we go on the assumption that people understand that. And guess what? Most people don't. And so one of my challenges to you today is we have to take it to another level. And that video is a perfect way to get me started. Now, some of the things I have here are going to cause you to say, what the heck? Why did we want to have this guy back? You're not authorized to throw anything at me. Because I'm from Texas, if you throw it at me, I'll throw it back. <laughs> but I promise you, halfway through this, when you're thinking that, you know, I need to go outside and throw up, uh, there's some really good stuff that I'm going to talk about. There's not much duplication. There's a little, for those of you who were here last time. So let's get started. Lots changed in the past year, since I was last here. And again, thank you very much for honoring me and asking me to come back. It doesn't happen very often. Typically, they ask me to stay away. But the Eurozone, which has been in crisis since 2008, continues to be in crisis, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And Hugo Chavez got reelected. He says legally, most of my friends in Venezuela do not agree that that was legal. And the only question is where the good Lord will take him before he serves his term. I'm not going to wish anything bad about Hugo Chavez. I'm going to try hard not to anyway. And the Middle East. We have Turkey and Syria on the verge of war. At one point, we thought we were going to have Israel and Iran on the verge of war. And then the Israelis said, let the Turks and the Syrians go after each other. They'll take out Iran for us. But it's a big issue for us because if that part of the world goes up, our oil prices are going to start to resemble California. In parts of California, gasoline is past $6 a gallon if that reason goes up. Speaking about oil... There's a good possibility that Nigeria may be split in half. The Muslim north separated from the Christian south. In fact, the only reason Nigeria is still the largest country by population in Africa is that the north doesn't want to give up access to oil revenues in the south. But they're going to resolve that issue because they have a group of crazy people who are abusing the name of Islam and just slaughtering Christians for no good reason at all. And then there's China. I talked a lot about China last year. Right now, and most Americans are not aware about this, there is a war for the soul of communist China going on between reformers who believe, as we believe, that the free market is the direction China has to go and those who want to go back to days of Mao. And if you've been hearing anything about Bo Xilai, the former mayor of Chongqing, he is the leader of what they call the left, 
The new left in China are the folks that want to go back to the crazy times of Mao Zedong. And that war is going on. It is the most brutal war. For any of us who study China and know about what's going on in China, it makes our politics look like kindergarten play. And it will be resolved two days after our election. And then we'll know where the largest country in the world and the second largest economy in the world will go based on who wins that war. And while that's going on, the growth in China is slowing down. And while the growth in China is slowing down, we're continuing to borrow more money than we spend. We have this crazy idea that we can spend more money than we bring in forever and there will be no consequences. Yet another bit of indication of our failure to teach people basic economics. People actually believe that. And in 28 days, we're going to have an election. Most of the attention is focused on who's going to be our next president, whether Obama's going to be reelected or it's going to be Mitt Romney. But this election is not just about president. This election is also about Congress and about the Senate. And it really doesn't make a difference who's in the White House if we have people with no backbone in Congress. And so it's very important for us in the business community, I don't care what party, this is truly nonpartisan, I don't care what your party is, I care about this. We must elect people who have the discipline and the backbone to make hard decisions. Because as you'll see from the next set of slides I'm going to share with you, there are going to be a lot of hard decisions that have to be made. Now, I give talks all over the country, and I go to some places where people say, you know, the good times are coming back. You know, I'm listening to the government, it says, you know, unemployment's gone down, job growth is going up, the good times are coming back. And so if we just hold on a little longer, we can do things like we've always done it in the past. And I ask them, well, what if that turns out not to be true? I'm a firm believer that when there are things that go wrong, when you're in the midst of chaos, that's a great opportunity for you to take advantage of it if you're prepared to see what's going on, be serious, and take action. So that's why my talk is the time for action is now. I believe that this is a great opportunity for Florida, in part because you've been kicked harder than a lot of states. You can't act like these are the great times because you know better. I believe the time for action for Florida is now. And partly because of my former home state. I was born and raised in California. If you ever want to go to the more, most beautiful, bankrupt place in the world, go to California. And I will tell you, that place is still in denial. But I'll tell you this also, and I was talking to my friends at the table. They will fall. They will fall. And when they do, the reset button will be pushed. And when the reset button of California is pushed, if Florida is not running as fast and as hard as it possibly can, Florida's going to have a new competitor. You know my analogy from last year about football. What do we know about football? If the other side scores a lot of points, who, whose fault is it? Is it theirs? No, it's ours. And if we don't like what happens, what do we do? Do we tell them to stop running fast? to drop the, the interception, to kneel down and wait for us to tackle them? No, we tell them, if you're doing well, our job is to do better. And so my challenge to you as I get started is, this is the greatest time to be a Floridian if you're prepared to run fast and hit hard. But if you don't, you're going to find people who are going to be running fast and hitting you hard. It's that simple. Last year, I talked about a strategic inflection point. And a strategic inflection point, I didn't want to give you the same quotes. I have a picture. Pictures are always better than words, right? It's that time in the history of a company or a country, in this case, the history of Florida, where you have a big choice to make. And your choice is, how do we make this state the most relevant, most positive, most dynamic state in the country? Or do we miss this opportunity and let California come back, let some other state replace us? Most of us don't know that the most dynamic economy in America today is the great state of North Dakota. Has the lowest unemployment rate, has the fastest growing economy, and I have good friends in North Dakota and Bismarck and Mandan. Let me tell you, when I fly in in the middle of the winter, these are amazing people. Because you look down and what you see is a house here, a ranch here, a farmhouse there, and no roads, just snow. They're tough, resilient, amazing people, and they've been blessed by God to be in the, <laughs> the pocket shell, and they're just printing money. But you know one of the problems they have? 
they have 120 or so thousand jobs that they can't fill. Because we in America have told people that we don't want our kids to be electricians or plumbers or welders. So they can't fill those jobs. We need to do something about that. So this is a picture from Greece. It's a picture taken in 2008. I could take a, find you a similar picture from 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, most likely through the rest of this decade. It's a human being and a police officer who's on fire. And what makes Greece so important to us is not the size of the economy. It's a country of about 10 million plus people. It's a small economy. But Greece is the birthplace of Western civilization. The concepts of democracy and personal responsibility and freedom and the republic, Socrates, Aristotle, all the people who are at the heart of Western civilization came out of Greece. And Greece is burning. And it's burning in a way that has a direct impact on us here in this country and in this room. But it's not just Greece. If you look at this slide, this slide looks at unemployment rates for people 25 years and younger. And in Greece and in Spain, it is over 51%. Now, I'm a firm believer that you have to look at the data objectively. You don't have to like it, but you have to see it as it is. And there's, I think I have it. I believe in what I call wearing ugly baby glasses. And we all know about ugly babies. We've all seen them. And what do we do when we see an ugly baby? We never tell their parents that they're ugly, right? Oh, you're such a cute little baby. It's so nice. And what are we thinking? Who's the daddy? <laughs> I sure hope that baby grows up to look like something other than this, because it's really ugly. And that's the polite thing to do, because you don't want to go up to new parents and say, you got the most butt ugly baby we've ever seen. That just doesn't work well. But in business, or as we say in Texas, in business, you have to be objective about what you see, because if you're not, you can't do something about it. And the big problem we have in this country is people, instead of putting on their ugly baby glasses and saying, holy crap, this doesn't make sense, they put on their, this is what I want to see glasses. And that never works. And so I have a bunch of ugly baby glasses slides. As I say, if you throw something at me, I'll throw it back. Because we're dealing with a lot of ugliness right now. This is a chart that looks at the S&P, the Dow Jones, excuse, excuse me, when our stock market crashed in October of 1929, which was the beginning of what became our Great Depression. And that is the line in red. The line in blue is the Greek equivalent of their Dow Jones. And it goes out to 1,100 days. And as you can see, the Greek stock market is faring worse than our Dow Jones fared during the Great Depression. There is, mark my words, no way Greece will survive in the Eurozone. It simply is not possible. What's going on right now in Europe is they're trying to figure out how to ease Greece's fall so that Greece doesn't take down Spain and Italy. But there is no way Greece can survive because its economy is too corrupt. There are too many people doing too many things and not being responsible for what they're doing. And the worry in Europe is what happens if Greece collapses in a disorderly way, and three or four million Greeks, because they can no longer find anything to eat, try to flee Greece to other parts of Europe. What happens? That's what they're worried about. But the real worry is Spain. The worry is that if Greece goes down, it will pull Spain. And the Spanish economy is four times larger than the Greek economy. This is something called the Misery Index, which looks at, looks at unemployment and inflation. And what you can see, the green line is Spain, that actually Spain is worse off than Greece, and Greece is not in good shape. Another way of looking at it is bankruptcies. And this is the number of corporate bankruptcies of Spanish firms each quarter. It's not a pretty sign. The rain on Spain. And this is what's going on in the economy of Spain. In the first three months of this year, according to the Central Bank of Spain, depositors removed so much money from the Spanish, from Spanish banks, that it was equivalent to 10% of Spain's GDP, almost 100 billion euros. 
And what's going on? In both Greece and in Spain, what's going on is that there's a growing fear that their countries are going to collapse, that their economies are going to collapse. And before that happens, the government will nationalize the banks and convert the euro into drachmas in Greece and pesetas in Spain, the old pre-euro currency, at an artificial rate that will be respected by nobody. And so what's going on is that those who are worried that this is going to happen are pulling money, pouring euros out of Spanish and Greek banks and redepositing it into German or Swiss or Austrian banks in Spain and Greece so that when it hits the fan, they still have euros. How do you turn around an economy when depositors are pulling money out of the banks right at the point when the banks are desperate for new cash? And you can't. How do you turn around an economy when 51% of your kids, people 25 years and younger, do not have jobs? When all you're guaranteed when you graduate from college is that you will not have a job? That's what the ugly baby glasses show us. And then there's Italy, which is the third largest economy in Europe. And all the projections are Italy is going to be in recession. We know the UK is in recession, Greece is in recession, Spain is in recession. The only thing keeping Europe alive is Germany. And what we know now is that the German economy is starting to slow down. Why is this important? This slide, which I think I showed last year, looks at the largest European banks and their ownership of sovereign debt from five countries. And as important as Greece is, as you can see, Greek sovereign debt is almost half of Spanish sovereign debt. And the big daddy is Italy. There simply is not enough money in Europe to bail out the governments and the banks of Spain and Italy. And so that's what the fight is all about. Why is that important to us here in Florida? There's some very bright and talented folks in the Eurozone who are looking for new places to come. And so one of my messages to you is you need to put out the welcome mat, not for old people who want to come here and die. I know that sounds crude. We all will die. That was the model of the 20th century. Come over here and be warm until you die. <laughs> and what we told our kids was, we're going to give you a great future. You can work at McDonald's and learn how to flip burgers. Or you can go to the rest homes and learn how to empty bedpans. That was the model of the past. That can't be the motto of the future. Because we've seen where that has given, taken us. It takes us only so far. We need to go out and tell people from Spain and from Greece and from Italy and from a lot of other countries, which I'll talk about, that if you have skills and if you're young, you need to come here because we need you. We're turning our economy around. We're making Florida the most dynamic place for young people to be. And we're giving our kids who grew up here a future that's attractive and exciting. As much as I love Disney World, there are only so many good jobs. And our now Chairman Emeritus has the best one. And there are not many jobs like that. And I say that as an ex-Disney employee. You probably didn't know that about me. When I was in college, I worked in uh, the original Disneyland out in Anaheim. It was a long commute, but I needed to work my way through college. And I learned a very important thing about people skills. One of my jobs was on the Tomorrowland cars, and my job was to make sure that pregnant women and people who are too short did not get on the cars. I remember one day saying to a woman, I said, dear, I'm sorry, but you can't get on this car. And she was taller than the, the height limit. She said, I'm taller than that. I said, yeah, but we don't allow pregnant women on these cars. She wasn't pregnant. I learned a lot that day. <laughs> and the first thing I learned was bobbing and weaving as she tried to knock the you-know-what out of me. I'm not pregnant. I'm gonna, how dare you say that? <laughs> it's unfortunately a true story. <laughs> but ugly baby glasses, what are we seeing? This is looking at central banks' sales or purchases of gold since 2007. And what are we seeing with this chart? 2010, 2011, central banks decided they needed to buy a lot of gold. Why? Why didn't they have full faith in their currency? Why are they buying gold? 
And one of the reasons is the next set of data. Every bit of data that I see, and this, all this, it's Business Insider's the website, but this is Bloomberg data, shows that we are on the verge of what I will predict to be a global recession. I don't care what the politicians say, they're running for office. I wear ugly baby glasses all the time. This makes me very unpopular with my wife. In the Suez Canal, container ship traffic is down. In the United States, Rail cars filled with garbage is down, and you don't generate garbage unless you generate economic activity. In the United States, exports to Europe are down. In Japan, exports are down. In South Korea, exports are down. In Taiwan, exports are down. Are you starting to get a picture? And in China, if you look at electricity use, it says, 2011 trend, it's an expiration of electricity use. 2011, it looked like China's economy was continuing to grow. The red dots are electricity use in 2012. And what we're seeing is that the consumption of electricity on the industrial scale is falling dramatically in China. And today, China is the economy that's been keeping the rest of us from catching a cold. Iron ore prices are falling. The largest purchaser of iron ore are the People's Republic of China, and they're not buying it anymore because their trade balance is going down and their industrial profit is negative. And this is the most dynamic economy in the world. The People's Bank of China just announced that growth is slowing down to a measly 7.7%. We would give a right and a left one for 7.7%. They are very worried that if it gets down to 6% in China, there will be a revolution that the people will say, this is unacceptable. And even in Hong Kong, what we're seeing is increased profit warnings. And so the data is clear if you put on your ugly baby glasses, especially if you look at the United States. We have an election in 28 days, and if you look at television, everybody's really excited, but if you drive around the neighborhoods in Texas, or in South Carolina, or in Iowa, or in Colorado, where I've been in the past few months, it's the quietest presidential election I've ever seen. It's very quiet. Compare it to 2008, it's very quiet. But this is a very important election, and it's not just important because of who we elect for president, it's even more important that we have people in the House and the Senate who are prepared to make hard decisions. Because look at the data, look at what has happened. None of us are better off than we were four years ago as Americans. And it's a bipartisan illness. I had this chart from last week, last year, this chart continues to be relevant. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, we have both been responsible for believing something that simply doesn't work in business, which is that you can spend 3% more than you bring in forever, and it's okay. As we say in Texas, that dog don't hunt. Why is that a problem? This is President Obama's proposed budget. Medicare, Medicaid, over a trillion dollars, Social Security, Add them together, it's $2 trillion. Then we have defense, which is small in comparison. But look at interest on the public debt. Compare that to education, or Homeland Security, or Justice Department, or Veterans Affairs. And what do we know about interest? Interest is lower today than it's been ever in my lifetime. We bank at Wells Fargo, and a few months ago, our banker called us and they said, would you like to refinance your loan? Why would you want to do that? Well, you have a 15-year mortgage at four and a quarter percent and we'll give you a 10-year mortgage at three and a quarter percent. And it won't cost you a penny. And we'll take two years off of your maturity date and you won't have to pay as much money on your mortgage. And we said, and you've been smoking what? But they were dead serious, and so we did it. We've never seen interest rates this low. Why is that important to us? Look at that number, 472 billion. That's about the same number we were paying on our federal debt in 2006 when interest rates are higher. If interest rates go back to 2006, 
then our second, our third highest expenditure of our federal dollars is paying interest. And remember, this is interest on the public debt. This is not paying principal back on the public debt. And so where is that going to come from if the interest rates go up? Did I say if? What will happen to us when the interest rates go up? Because we can't be like Greece. And Greece said, sovereign debt, yeah, that's a nice idea. We're going to take a 70% haircut, investors. We're going to give you 30 cents, 30 euros, cents on the euro. We can't do that. We're too big. Remember the last election when there's a debate about whether or not there is a recession going on? And of course, there's no recession until the day after the election, and there's been a recession for a year. Well, you hear a lot of people saying that, you know, the economy is doing better. Here's the data. What this is, is a chart that looks at every single recession since 1948. The zero line represents the number of jobs the economy had at the beginning of the recession. The bottom of the line represents how many jobs were lost. The bottom chart is the number of months. And when it gets back to zero, that means you've recovered the jobs you had when the recession started. That line, that ugly line in the red in the bottom is our current recession the one that started in 2007. As you can see, it is the longest, most brutal recession we've seen. And it's still going on. Now, technically we're not in recession because the GDP is growing, but for the millions of Americans who've lost their jobs, it's not growing fast enough. And one of the reasons is because we are borrowing a ton of money. And we're paying interest on it instead of using that money to grow our economy. Beginning of the century is $5.7 trillion. Last night, or actually this morning at about 2 a.m., I was really bright, by the way. I got to tell you the story. I said, I got to make sure I get here. And I fly a lot with American, but they've been having challenges with their pilots. So I'm not going to fly American. I'm going to fly Delta. I'll make it better. And then they closed down one of the uh, runways at Hartsfield. <laughs> So two hours late, I ended up spending the night in Atlanta, so I had plenty of time to work on this. But as of today, our debt is $16.16 trillion. That's a le almost $11 trillion in 12 years. And if we continue spending the way we're spending, that number will be $22.5 trillion by 2016. That just is not sustainable. And the implications for us when interest rates go up are significant. Because what we're looking at now is labor participation in this country at the same rate as it was in 1981. In 1981. There are a lot of Americans who are not working. There are a lot of Americans who have given up looking for work. And there are a lot of Americans who want to work who can't find jobs. And I just heard as I was coming in the radio, there are a lot of Americans, I think two-thirds of Americans say, I have a job I don't particularly like, but I need to work. So I'm working at jobs I don't particularly like. What we see in this country mirrors what we see in the rest of the world. People are not spending, they're not investing, they do not have confidence that this economy is going to turn. And if they don't spend and invest because they don't have confidence this economy is going to turn, guess what? It becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. And if we don't think about growing our economy, you know, there's an argument that you have to raise taxes or you got to cut spending, and obviously you can't waste money, and there's some taxes that need to be raised. One of them is Social Security. Now, what do I mean by that? The cap is $110,000. We have a football coach, Mac Brown, who makes $5.3 million for coaching our football team which means somewhere around the eighth day of January, he stops paying Social Security tax of January each year. And I know Mac, and he's a good man, and I guarantee you Mac would not complain if he continued to pay Social Security tax for the rest of the year. He would not notice. But my friends who are economists say that if we took the cap out, we would extend the life of Social Security, even with Congress rating it, for another 20 years. And we have our highway tax, which is supposed to, fuel tax, which is supposed to help us rebuild our infrastructure. It's the same sense that it was when it was passed in the early 70s. It's not tied to the cost of fuel. It's tied to a specific amount. But the real issue is growing our economy. And most of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of today is about how do we do that. You can't cut your way to growth. 
And Lord knows, you know, you can't raise taxes and grow. And so what we need to do as business men and women as, and leaders of our community, we need to focus on how do we send a very clear message that the only way we solve this problem is we got to grow our economy as aggressively and as fast as possible. Because right now, we are addicted to debt in a way that is staggering. This is a chart that just kind of blows me away. Our rate of deficit spending today is equal to what it was at the peak of the Civil War. And as you all know, the Civil War is the most bloody war in America's history. More Americans died at the hands of other Americans than with all of our wars combined. 600,000 Americans died in the Civil War. But our population was only 32 and a half million people back then. Our population today is 314 million people. And so if you make the adjustment, instead of 600,000 Americans dying, it'd be 4.7 million Americans dying. And many good men and women have died in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the number is about 6,500. And we are borrowing money at the rate that's a only be justified if we were in a war where 4.7 million Americans had died in war and they have not. What are we using that money for? Why are we spending so much? Why have we become addicted to deficit spending? And why are we borrowing that money from the People's Republic of China? This is from the United States Department of Treasury tick report. This is the website you can go check it yourself. In May of 2008, China was buying a half trillion dollars of our treasuries. In July, it was 1.1 trillion dollars of our treasuries. And if you add Taiwan and Hong Kong, which I call wholly owned subsidiaries, that's almost 1.5 trillion dollars by those three countries. Our deficit spending last year was about 1.35 trillion dollars. So we are dependent now on the Chinese to finance our addiction to deficit spending. And what happens if they say, I don't think so? Would they dare do that? What happens if they say, we'll continue to finance your deficit spending, but we don't just want your treasury bonds, we want to buy your assets. What we know is that the AMC movie chain was purchased by a Chinese company for two and a half billion dollars. And one of the things that company said they're going to do, as our largest chain of movie theaters, is they're going to invest an additional $500 million to upgrade the technology because the Americans need help. Chinese can do a better job. Does that feel good? We've got to grow ourselves, my friend. And so, this, nobody threw anything at me, right? It's a great time. I'm a firm believer in this. When bad things happen, the first group of people who take it seriously and say, I'm going to do something about it, are the people who have the greatest opportunity. Because everybody else is in shock. Oh, I don't think I like that. It used to be the most dynamic economy in America, and one of the most dynamic economies in the world was California. They are in denial, my friends. There's an interesting Wall Street Journal article that came out, or op-ed piece that came out that said, 12% of the people in America live in California. One third of the people on welfare live in California. And so what happens when you have a vote to raise taxes on the middle class? You have a third of all the people on welfare in one state. What do you think you're going to do? Last year, statistics I could find, half of California's state revenue came from the top 1% of the taxpayers. Half. And more than half of Californians did not pay any state income tax. And so when Governor Brown says, we're going to have a temporary increase on everybody making more than $250,000, guess what's going to happen? That's going to pass. So why should you care about that? Because a lot of small and medium-sized business people are going to say, that's it. I'm moving. I gave a speech three years ago in Boise, Idaho, and the Idahoans... I don't know what they call themselves. I like calling them Idahoans. Anyway, they were complaining that there are too many people in Cal in, from California in, in Boise. And if it didn't, something didn't happen, there'd be more Californians in Idaho than in California. And guess what? That's the case now. You see that in Oregon. You see that in Washington. You see that in Texas. You get many Californians here, you got to go after them. 
because they're looking for a new place to go. And you have something that Texas, quite frankly, doesn't have. You have better beaches. Your part of the Gulf is a heck of a lot better than our part of the Gulf. If you ever go down to the Gulf of Mexico where we have it, you look at it, you don't want to put your feet in it. So why is it a great time to be alive? This is one of the most God-forsaken, cold places you could ever be, Wells, in the United Kingdom. And I was talking to some people there back in the early 90s about how they transformed their economy, and they told me a fascinating story. They said, we used to be big in coal mining. Problem is, our coal deposits were so deep that we lost money for every ton we put out of the ground. And Margaret Thatcher said, that doesn't make any sense, and she stopped it. We used to be big in shipbuilding. Problem is, we couldn't compete with the Japanese and the Koreans and the Finns and the Danes, and so that business went away. We used to be, we used to be, and we were on the verge of collapse. We had 16% unemployment, it was spiking, there was no hope. And then they said, what do we need to do to turn our economy around? And they asked the question, which I'll ask you again and again and again, they said, what do we need to do to turn our economy around? And they said, we have to be relevant to somebody who needs us. And they had this conversation, Chamber of Commerce of Wales, the government of Wales, at a time when the European Union was starting to come together, 1992, way back when there, 20 years ago. And the idea about the European Union in 1992 was that once you were in one country, you had free access to the rest of the Eurozone. And so they asked this question, who would want to have free access to the rest of the Eurozone? What companies would like to be here in Wales instead of in London or in France or in Germany? And they said, hmm, Japanese companies. They decided to become the place in Europe to go after Japanese companies and say, if you're going to do business in Europe and you want to be in the Eurozone, come to Wales. Oh, by the way, we have a lot of country clubs. And before they made the offer, they went to the country clubs and said, when you get Japanese visitors, welcome them. Because they'll think your membership fee is cheap. Cheapest initiation fee to join a country club in Japan is $300,000. In fact, it's so expensive to play golf in Japan, if you go to Hawaii, you'll see there are Japanese that will fly to Hawaii and live in a hotel for two weeks to play golf because it's cheaper than playing golf in Japan. And they said, welcome them. They talked to the university and said, we need to have classes in Japanese. And they did everything they could to make Wales an attractive place for Japanese business people, and guess what? It became the place where a Japanese firms located to serve the rest of the Eurozone. Wales, turn their economy around. I saw from your website that you talk about Singapore and the idea of freedom in Singapore. I spent a lot of time in Singapore. My wife was born and raised in China, but she's now a citizen of Singapore. It is by far the most amazing country on the planet. And they do some things that we will never be able to do like attract some of the best public servants and then pay them an incredible amount of money. But Singapore was not always like that. In 1965, when it became a country, it became a country because the Malaysians kicked them out and they kicked them out of the Malaysian Confederation because they were too Chinese. They didn't like them. In the midst of race riots against Chinese, slaughtering them in the streets. Go by yourself. Go be by yourself. And the founder of Singapore said, we will show those people little small country, at the time two and a half million people, today five and a half million people. Today Singapore, a country of five and a half million people, has a billion dollars more exports than India, a country of 1.2 billion people. And the way they do that is they made themselves relevant. And if you listen to Lee Kuan Yong, who's the founder, he says, if you don't make yourself relevant, you have no reason to exist. My challenge to you is what do we do to make Florida relevant to people who do not want to come here to die? Because that is our future in this state. It's to turn this state into a place where young people are fighting to come here, where young people are fighting to create businesses here, where people from all over the world say, there are a couple of places we can go in the United States. One of them is Texas, and the other one is Florida. You can do that. 
And well, quite frankly, if you don't do that, it will not happen. Singapore. There's so many things about Singapore that are cool. As I said, there's one thing we will never do in this country because that's just who we are. They have this crazy idea that if you're going to get good people in the public sector, you need to pay them well and then tie their success to the success of the private sector. And how they've done that? Their ministers, similar to what we call cabinet members, their salaries are tied to the average of the highest paid CEOs in the private sector. And I've met some of the people in the public sector running the government of Singapore, this little city state of 5.5 million people. They are amazing. If you met them, you'd find it hard to believe that they're public sector employees. They're just as good as we are, and they have a choice. They can either work in the public or private sector. Why? Because the least paid member of the Singapore cabinet as a minister is paid $900,000 U.S. a year. The Minister of Defense is paid $175,000 U.S. a month. And the quality of the people they get is world class. And their ability to continue to pivot and move, pivot and move and be competitive is based on the fact that the public and private sector both know that they're world class people on both sides and they respect each other. That will not happen here. We will not pay our public sector employees that much. So we have to figure out another way to get good, bright people like you and I to serve in the public sector in spite of the fact that we'll take a big hit financially. And there's Spartanburg, South Carolina. If you drive a BMW X5 or X3, you're buying a vehicle made in Spartanburg, South Carolina, a little old metropolis with 37,500 people. And I've been there. They have the highest concentration of foreign headquarters per capita in the United States. Because they decided, like Wales, they were going to make themselves the most hospitable place for foreign companies that made things, that manufactured things. Come on over here to South Carolina. We want you. And I was flying in with a partner from Ernst & Young, and he's from Alabama. And he was talking about how Tuscaloosa was able to get Mercedes-Benz to build the SUVs in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and how outside of Atlanta there's a Kia plant, and down in Mississippi there's a Nissan Titan plant. And now we have something which I think is really cool. We have a Toyota Tundra truck made in San Antonio that says, made in Texas, made by Texans, a Toyota. All of these cities and communities did the same thing. They said, how do we make ourselves relevant? How do we remake ourselves? And Spartanburg is doing really well. I'm from Austin. I moved to Austin in 1989. The city was not well. Everybody now talks about how cool Austin is. Every one of those buildings that you see in that picture was in receivership. A building on the far right, yep, you're far right, that's the Four Seasons office building. When I moved to Austin in 1985, a third of it was still slab. The exterior looked cool, but if you walked in, it was slab. And I learned the hard way. You know, you go into an elevator and it starts to close and you put your hand out there. An electric eye or a rubber thing is supposed to stop it. Now that building was being financed by Southland, the folks who owned 7-Eleven. They'd gone bankrupt in Dallas and so they hadn't finished doing anything. So the first time I put my hand in it, it just closed. And the elevator started moving. I didn't do that again. We were in trouble in Austin. This was the corner of Six and Lamar which now is the headquarters of Whole Foods. The city was in serious financial trouble. And all over Austin, there was a wonder about whether or not this city was going to make it. There were boarded up buildings on the main street of Austin going to the capital of Texas. And there's a hotel now called the Stephen S. Austin. It's an intercontinental. It was empty. It had been empty for 20 years. There were bats, not in the belfry, but in the hospital, in, in the hotel. This is Austin today. In five years, we'll have twice as many skyscrapers. And it didn't happen by accident. It happened because of this. We became high tech because we attracted IBM to Austin for the purpose of allowing us to build selectric typewriter keyboards. We did such a good job in the keyboards that, heck, we'll let you build the typewriter. And that was the beginning of our love affair with the 
high-tech community. But here's where it's really valuable for you guys. I saw that when I came to Austin in 1989, I, and that's what we continue to do today. We have groups of the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce who on a regular basis, with their own money, go to California and look for companies that bring them back to Texas. Poaching trips. And we're successful. Remember once we had a company move from San Jose to Austin, and we asked the CEO, we had a press conference. Whoopee, we won another one. We had a press conference. We asked the CEO, why would you move from San Jose to Austin? This was in the middle of the 1990s. He said, it's really very simple. In San Jose, I can afford a house. Nobody else in my company can afford a house. It's so expensive there. I can afford a house. In Austin, I, my senior management, and my frontline supervisors, in fact, everybody can afford a house, as even my lowest paid employees, because we have houses in Austin 35 minutes away, brand new houses for $100,000 to $110,000. You can't do that in California. And so what we did, what we continue to do, what you have to do is we look for places where there's a lot of pain, a lot of ability, where people had businesses, their businesses were being pummeled by government. Doesn't that sound like California? And we said, come on over. We want you here. I saw on your slide set that you tout that you have a great business climate. You do. But you can't just sit back and wait for somebody to come. You know, a quarterback may throw an interception by accident. He's more likely to throw an interception if you have four defensive ends and tackles hanging around his legs. If you want it to happen, you need to make it happen. You wanted me to come back here. So I'm here with my ugly baby glasses. And our chamber in Austin played a big role. They were the leaders of this effort. The city said, well, I don't know. The university said, well, I don't know. And the chamber says, no, we're going to do this. We had a great leadership team for the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce. We had some visionary private sector leaders who were willing to put their time, energy, and money. And we turned the suck around. And we focused on what do high-tech companies and entertainment companies want? But more importantly, the last bullet point, what do young families want? And we sold the quality of life for young families. And if you go around Austin on a Saturday or a Sunday, it's amazing how much is going on in that town with young families. We made ourselves relevant to young families. Let's talk about Florida. You have some great schools, some great universities. Have you, the chamber, ever done what they did at MIT? This was done by the Kauffman Foundation out of Kansas City, Missouri. They looked at MIT graduates and the companies they created at the end of 2008 published a report in 2009. And just looking at graduates of MIT, 26,000 companies, 3.3 million employed, $2 trillion in annual revenue. And in 2009, MIT companies would have been the 11th largest economy in the world. That's just MIT. You have some great universities in this state. Have you given the people of this state an understanding of how much wealth, how many jobs, how much capability your universities have created? If you haven't, you need to get after it. Florida State, University of Florida, Central Florida, University of Southern Florida, University of Miami, the list goes on. You have some great schools here. They've had a big impact. Have you ever told the story? If you don't tell people, guess what? They won't know. And if you don't know it, how the heck are they going to know it? We have this, I talked about this last time, I'll talk about it until good Lord takes me someplace else, or you throw enough stuff at me. We have this love-hate relationship with immigrants, which is bizarre, from my opinion, because this is a country of immigrants. You either came over here because you're escaping religious persecution, you're an indentured servant, and you came over here because you were poor and you worked your way out of poverty, or like my forebears, you came over here as a slave. But one way or the other, you came here as an immigrant. There are a few Native Americans that we haven't killed. But most of us were immigrants. And now we have questions about whether or not we want immigrants. Look at this data. You get rid of 
immigrant created companies that venture capital firms funded and you get rid of 25% of our publicly traded companies. And today, we have a conversation about immigration. Our conversation is conversation about people who do not have documents. What we don't talk about are all the immigrants who are in our schools who want to stay, who we tell, we don't want you here. You're getting a master's in engineering or a PhD in engineering, we're not going to give you a work permit. We don't want you here. Go back to your country and compete with us. Why does that make any sense? But that's what's happening. I guarantee you, every single one of your universities in this state has great men and women from foreign countries who are getting advanced degrees who'd like to stay here, and we're telling them, go home. We don't want what you did before to happen here. We don't want you to create new businesses. We don't want you to innovate. We want you to go home and compete with us. Now think about that business model. They were educated by China or Korea or India or Israel, educated at the other country's expense. They come here to get their final degrees and we tell them, go home. We need to have an immigration policy that's very simple. If you have skills that we need to grow our economy, the welcome mat is there, and we don't. We spend all of our time talking about undocumented people. That's another issue. It's an important issue. But to talk about that and not to have a policy, I, let me tell you, I have a friend of mine, a former student of mine who's a friend. He's an engineer. His wife is a medical doctor. He came here legally. He was able to get a work permit. He's now a green card holder. His wife will finally be able to work in her profession after staying here for seven years. Why does it make sense to have a trained MD sit at home because she can't get a job, because she will not work unless she has a job permit and she can't get one? Why does that make sense? That's our policy right now. I know you got a bunch of farms here. This is a great time to be a farmer. There's more and more stuff that the Chinese and the Indians and a lot of other people are going to be buying. And I predict by the end of this decade there will be no farm support bill. We will be able to sell as much as we can produce and the world will buy it. As we know, prices are high and they're going to go higher. But really, this is where you should be. I've been talking about this and two people say I must have had water on my brain when I was born. I'm a firm believer in power for the ocean from the ocean. I don't talk about people power, people walking on the water. I'm talking about electricity. And why am I talking? You see, I got somebody to laugh. She's from a power company, too. Ugh. <laughs> Same to you. She's gorgeous, but she's laughing at me. Uh, that's the story of my life, I'll tell you. The European Energy Agents Association says, if you look at the potential energy stored in the ocean, it's equivalent to five times the amount of electri electricity used today. That really got you guys excited, didn't it? So maybe this will help. I saw with your video, you say, if we really screw things up enough, we'll be like France. Well, guess what? Since 1967, this power plant on the Racine River in France has been generating 240 megawatts with tidal power since 1967. So in terms of ocean-generated electricity, maybe it would be nice to be like the French. Why is this important? Here's how this game works. There are things called tides, you know about that, things called waves, things called ocean currents. All of them are controlled by God directly, by the sun and the moon indirectly. And they're available all the time. Even in New York City, there's the French and the New Yorkers. I'm not sure which is worse. But even in New York City, they are working on capturing tidal power to generate electricity for the city of New York. Now, why is that important? You still have to build equipment, so you have your capital expenses, and you obviously have to maintain it, so you have operations and maintenance expenses, and they're slightly higher because the stuff is in the ocean but your fuel cost is zero unless you want to pay a bill to God. Zero fuel costs. 
and it always will be zero. Because when it's not zero, that means the sun is not there or the moon is not there, and at that point, we're not worried about energy. Back in 2009, there are only nine tidal power plants that are being tested today. It's about 45, and I must tell you that earlier, no, last month, for the first time in America's history, electricity generated by a tidal power plant actually went into the grid off the coast of Maine. And now, in Korea, they've gotten very excited about tidal power plants. This plant is now a year old, August of last year. 245 megawatts. What makes this power plant interesting is 245 megawatts with it just capturing half the tide. They had to do, cut a deal with environmentalists, let the fish go. So that's just half of its potential. Its real potential is almost 500 megawatts, which is a nice sized cold fire plant. The Koreans are working on something that's huge, and that is a 1.3 gigawatt tidal power plant next to the airport. And I talked to one of my friends who's a retired Army colonel. He said, I've seen the tidal flow next to Incheon Airport. It is ferocious. Now, why is that important? Do you have tides in Florida? You know, I look at Florida, it looks like a finger in the ocean, right? And I use this finger, folks, this finger, okay? A finger in the ocean. You are surrounded. You have, you have to have the longest coastline in America. You are perfectly positioned to take advantage of tides. You are perfectly positioned to take advantage of waves. But this wave power plant, which is one of 10, is off the coast of Oregon, not Florida. This is an ocean power corporation wave power plant goes up and down, and as it goes up and down, it generates electricity, and that electricity has a fuel cost of zero. Zero. Why is that important? This is a, this is a wave energy pump produced by a company in that great oceanic state of Minnesota. In fact, this company is from Eden Plary, Minnesota. If you've ever been to Minnesota, the one thing they do not have is oceanfront property. But this is called a sea dog pump, and you probably can't see it. It's much simpler than the other one, much simpler than the other one, because all it does is pump water. It uses the tide, uh, the, the, the waves to pump water out of the top. Why is that important? They've been able to come up with a schematic that they're now testing off the coast of Houston. You put an array of these sea dog pumps. It pumps enough water to create enough electricity that you can then put that water up into a tank and use the electricity and the gravity flow from that tank to desalinate salt water where the energy cost, fuel cost, is zero. Now you double, triple, or quadruple that field of pumps and not only are you desalinating water now on an industrial scale, but you have additional electricity to pump that fresh water wherever you need it. And given that you are the land of sinkholes and the Everglades, and you're worried about fresh water, think about what that technology can do. But more importantly, think about what that could do for the state of Florida. If you own generating electricity and desalinating water, if you own that technology, there are countries all over the world that are desperate for fresh water. And this is a game changer. Whoever owns this technology, using ocean-generated electricity to desalinate ocean water and pump it wherever it's needed, whoever owns that technology is going to create an industry that is massive. And so my friends in Florida, you have a choice. Bedpans or desalinization? You got a choice. You, it's your choice. You choose. I'm not from Florida, but if I were from Florida, I'd say, good grief. They're going to die anyway, so we might as well make something, right? And then there's something called ocean currents. There's a thing called the Florida Current, and scientists from Maine and Florida International University have studied the Florida Current, which moves at a rapid three miles an hour, and they said it has enough electricity power potential in it to meet the entire electric generation requirements of the state of Florida, that one current. And there's nothing in it right now but fish. This is big. 
When I first started talking about this three years ago, people thought I was totally crazy. Now they just think I'm crazy. But these are, their projects are coming online. In fact, there's a contest in Scotland, 10 million euros, for the first company to successfully capture wave energy off the coast of Scotland. Scotland is ahead of Florida. And then finally, we all have seen heat pumps. Heat pumps that take heat out of the air, put heat in the air, that use the heat and air condition your house. 72% of the earth is covered by the ocean. And as you can see by these zones, if you get a temperature differential greater than five degrees centigrade, that is enough to generate electricity just by the temperature differential. And the fuel cost is zero, thanks to God. Those of us who study this have said, when we are able to capture that conversion, that will be the cheapest source of electricity on the planet, and it's available 24-7. And as you can see, Florida is in the best place of any state in the United States to do that, with the exception of Hawaii, which is in the middle of nowhere anyway. So the question I have is, will you do this? Right now, the leading companies for this are in Minnesota and in Maine. There's some in Florida, but not many here. Will you do this? Because it's a simple technology. The United States Department of Energy has done an experimental plant, 75 megawatts, ocean thermal conversion off the coast of Hawaii. It works. This technology works. You just got to work on the details. If I were in Florida, and if I had the ability to do anything in this state, I would make sure we would invest in this technology, because if we can do that, we will create jobs at every single level for our scientists and our researchers, for our business people, for our kids who want to work in the field, welders, electricians, plumbers, plants to make the stuff, for our shipping companies who want to export it. We could become the center of the world for this form of energy. Now, why is this better than solar or wind? What do we know about the tides? You can go down to any bait shop and get a tide book. It'll tell you what the tide is going to do for the next 100 years, and it'll be accurate to the second, because the sun and the earth and the moon are very big things. And you can map an estuary, and you can know, even though the tide flows in and out every eight hours, you can map the estuary, and you can know to the second how much energy you can produce every single second. What do we know about waves? Enough wave energy is there for us to produce electricity from waves 90% of the time. At best, with solar, it's 50%. At best, with wind, it's 40%. With waves, it's 90% of the time. And these ocean currents, 100%, baby. Whoever captures this technology and makes themselves the home of ocean-generated electricity is going to have the most, they're going to have something that makes Silicon Valley look small because everybody needs electricity. So let me talk about a few more things, and then you can throw things at me. You have something I saw on your website called Amendment 4. Pass it, please. I was in California when we were going through Prop 13, Jarvis Gann. And what happened in California back then in 1978, yes, I am old, in 1978 was property taxes were going up so rapidly that old folks were being forced out of their houses that they completely paid for because they couldn't afford property taxes. And there was a movement of senior citizens saying, give us some relief, Sacramento. And the folks in Sacramento said, up yours. We know better what to do with your money than you do. And so the Jarvis Gam Proposition 13 was a threat. If you don't give us relief, we'll pass this. And they said, you can't pass it, up yours. And it passed. Nobody ever thought it would pass, including the people who wrote it. And what did it do? It said, as long as you held on to your house or your business property, property taxes could not go up by more than 2% a year, regardless of the value of your property. So for the first year, it's like, that's kind of interesting. And then people figured out the math. And the price of housing started to go up because people stopped selling their homes. As supply went down, demand went up. As demand went down, up and supply went down, prices went up. I can give you a personal example. I bought a house in the Oakland Hills in 1976 for $70,000. I sold it to go to business school for $125,000 two years later. A year after Proposition 13 passed, I was stupid. 
The next year, my broker called me and said, oh, John, your house just flipped for $250,000. Ten years later, it was worth $1.2 million. Today, it's worth $3.1 million. And if I still had it, my total bill, mortgage and property tax, would be $1,000 a month for a $3.1 million house. Now, for me, that would have been really cool. But for everybody in California who's young, that's been a disaster because they can't afford anything anymore. Even at Stanford, they can't. Young professors who are just hired to teach at Stanford can't afford a house closer than an hour and a half commute each way. And so Stanford is building condos for them. That's what high property taxes do. You've got to do something about it. It is killing California, and people are afraid to touch it. And as long as they do not touch Prop 13, California will continue to sink under the sea. But at some point, they'll change that. And when they do it, California will start running fast. You have zero personal income taxes. That's really cool. Are you telling the story about why people should come to Florida? Because you're not the only state. We have zero personal income taxes, and we're going out all the time saying, come on to Texas. It's a good place to be. And I've been told by my friends in Florida that the county that has the highest educational attainment is the county that used to have NASA. And NASA's gone. And now you have some great engineers who can't find jobs. You've got to be all like that county in Florida. Because the thing that gets young people most excited about coming to the state is the quality of public education, not getting a sunburn on the beach. On Sunday, a man that I despise was elected for a third time. I'm looking for the ad that the Florida Chamber of Commerce has in Spanish, encouraging professionals and middle class business people in Venezuela to come here until Hugo Chavez goes someplace else. I was talking with my students yesterday in class from Mexico and Colombia and Venezuela, and they said, oh, yes, we're seeing it right now. We're seeing people flee. Put out the welcome mat, my friends. These are bright, capable people. Think of what the Cubano community has done for Florida. Florida should be, remember it's a finger sticking out in the ocean? Florida should be the place where people from South America come to do business. It should be the hub of all global business for this hemisphere. But guess what? We're fighting you also. And we got a ton of people from Mexico who are worried about the drug violence who have now come all over Mexico, all over Texas, buying stuff. Some people tell me up to two-thirds of the skyscrapers in San Antonio are owned by Mexican nationals. But I will know, when I was talking about this yesterday, one of my students has a father who's in real estate here in Orlando. And he said, in 2008 and 2009, Venezuelans were keeping his father's business alive in Orlando, even when the housing market was collapsing because they were so tired of Chavez. But Hugo has promised that he's going to finish socializing Venezuela. And if you're in the private sector, what does that mean? He's going to rip your heart out. And what we've seen in California, we're going to see in Venezuela. What we've seen in California, we've seen in Mexico. People have choices. In fact, even in France, the new premier of France, Monsieur Hollande, has said, I want to grow the economy. Oh, by the way, I'm going to have a temporary tax on those who are making more than a million euros. A temporary tax, just for a few years, of 75 percent. 75 percent. Because I know these are patriotic French men and women, and they will stay and give 75 cents of every euro to the government so it can waste it. And so what is happening in France? When you talk to real estate brokers in the UK and in Switzerland, they say they've seen unprecedented numbers of wealthy French people saying, enough, moving out with no plans to come back. There are wealthy people, there are hardworking people in Venezuela, in Mexico, and other Latin American countries who would like to come live in the United States. Do you want them, Florida? It's your choice. There's a guy named John Cotter. He's a professor of business at Harvard Business School. Sorry, I didn't mean to wake you up. Harvard Business School. And he says, if you're going to change a very large, stubborn organization that has a lot of inertia, you've got to create what he calls a sense of urgency. What we call that in Texas, you've got to scare the snot out of people. You've got to convince people that unless they change, bad things are going to happen. 
we fight that battle every day in Texas. I don't know how successful you are in Florida. You have to convince people that things have to change. You have to make one thing a priority in your budget, which is that you will not shortchange public education. The issue of public sector unions is another issue. But in terms of your children, you have to make sure that your children know that you care for them. Why is that important? Right now, we have our kids owing more than a trillion dollars in loans for going to college. That's a big number. Let me put it in context, that big number. I have a sign saying, shut up soon. OK, I got it. Please take it away. Goodbye. They're making it larger. OK. <sighs> I didn't know my wife was here. OK. A trillion dollars. Let me put that in context. Between 2000 and 2008, when we had the subprime debacle, the amount of home loan indebtedness in America went up three times. Between 2000 and 2008, the amount of student loan indebtedness went up six times, twice as fast. That makes no sense. Because what happens? Let's think about Economics 101. If kids graduate with, hunt, with tens of thousands of dollars of debt, what happens? They move back home. If they move home, they don't get an apartment. They don't buy a house. They put off getting married. They put off getting married. They put off having kids. What does that do to our economy? We've got to do something about it. For a lot of kids graduating from college, they could have made more money if they'd gone to technical school and become a plumber or a welder or electrician. And if you've ever had to hire one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But we still have this idea that if people work with their hands, there's something unclean about them. And that is totally stupid. I know you are one of the 13 states that teaches kids about economics, but how about kids who are not in school, like the rest of us? How well do the people of Florida understand what we do for a living? I talked about that at the beginning, and I'm ending with that. And how important are our community colleges? They don't have football teams. How important are our community colleges? Our community colleges are at the heart of what we need to do to revitalize our economy, not just here in Florida, but also in Texas. And do you have an aggressive plan, program, chamber, business to university program to commercialize technology? Can you tell me what is the greatest technology being developed in each one of your universities that's ready for commercialization? You should be able to do that. The money's being spent. The stuff is there. That's what attracts people to your community. That's what attracts people to Austin. So I'm going to end with this. I showed it last time. I'll show it again. I got a question for you. What does this city know about luxury? Huh? What does a town that's been to hell and back know about the finer things in life? Well, I'll tell you, more than most. You see, it's the hottest fires that make the hardest steel. Add hard work and conviction and the know-how that runs generations deep in every last one of us. That's who we are. That's our story. Now, it's probably not the one you've been reading in papers, the one being written by folks who've never even been here and don't know what we're capable of. Because when it comes to luxury, it's as much about where it's from as who it's for. Now, we're from America, but this isn't New York City, or the Windy City, or Sin City, and we're certainly no one's Emerald City. city and this is what we do the next time I come back if you ever invite me back I want to put up a video that tells your story that has the same punch and same conviction of this video that is selling Detroit 
the most sad city in America. But the people of Detroit are proud of who they are. They are not giving up. They are going to fight. You know what's interesting about that video? It's produced by Chrysler using M&M after Chrysler was taken over by Fiat, an Italian company. It took an Italian company to understand the spirit of the people of Detroit. Is it going to take an Italian company to take over Florida? Or are the people in this room capable of saying to the world the same thing that you saw in that video? I believe the answer is you can. I believe the answer is you will. And I know this, you really have no choice. But I have faith in you and I have faith in Florida. Thank you for your time. Thank you.